Now, as silicon process technology has uh, continued over the last several decades, there have been numerous um, enhancements made to the, the basic uh, process technologies um, that, that I've presented so far. So let's go through uh, a number of the uh, largest process enhancements that have, have happened over the years. Um, one of the first ones uh, was using multiple threshold voltages and gate oxide thicknesses. So instead of using the same threshold voltage for all NMOS and all PMOS in our design um, and the same gate oxide thickness everywhere, um, we can customize uh, certain, um, certain transistors will have a different VT than other transistors. So uh, let's talk about how that uh, helps us. So if we have, let's say, a lower threshold voltage for a transistor, this will provide more current when the transistor is on because our current is uh, a function of your VGS minus VT squared. So as VT decreases, your VGS minus VT value goes up. And so you get a higher on current, but that you sacrifice um, by having a lower threshold voltage uh, when you try to turn the transistor off you'll have a higher leakage so basically you'll get a faster transistor but it will be higher power um, it'll consume more more leakage power and uh, cost you more power in your design um, so what you might wind up doing for example is uh, you when you are designing your chip, you'll have some paths that are more timing critical than others. And so maybe you'll use these low VT transistors on let's say five to 10% of your most critical timing paths, but use a higher VT, lower leakage, lower power on all of your non-timing critical paths. Um, similarly, using a thinner gate oxide uh, can provide more on current um, in a similar way as a lower VT, but it has a lower breakdown voltage um, and a higher gate leakage current. So um, you might use a thicker gate oxide for, volt, uh, for circuits that require higher voltage circuits like uh, your analog and IO circuits um, and use a thinner oxide in your digital circuits. So another uh, process enhancement um, has been uh, you can use a silicon on insulator uh, technology so instead of using a bulk lightly doped silicon crystal uh, we use in a, uh, as our substrate we use a substrate that basically is an insulator um, and the two main insulators uh, for silicon processing are silicon dioxide and sapphire the main advantage of silicon or uh, of silicon on insulator is you eliminate a lot of your large parasitic reverse bias PN junction um, between your source drain regions um, to the transistor body. And uh, I'll go into more on SOI in the next foil. Um, but a second advantage is you actually get a lower uh, sub, sub threshold leakage um, going on in your transistors. So as I mentioned in the previous foil, uh, the two main types of silicon on insulator um, are shown here in this figure. Uh, one is you can have a sapphire uh, uh, substrate where you build um, your N and P devices right on top of the sapphire insulator. Um, the other is you can have a silicon substrate, but then you create a buried silicon oxide layer on top of that silicon substrate and then you build your uh, transistors on top of that buried silicon oxide layer. Um, both of them uh, create a insulator substrate uh, so they, they kind of behave mostly the same um, and so I'll, I'll go into you can see um, in both cases uh, we have on top of the insulating layer um, for our NMOS devices, we have a fairly thin N plus um, source and drain, and then a fairly thin, again, 
uh, P uh, channel between the N plus source and drain. And in this particular case, uh, when we're doing SOI, that P channel that's between the N plus source and drain is uh, what's called a floating body. Um, so we don't actually, in uh, normal bulk uh, silicon, when we create our NPN device, that P channel is connected, is our body, and we actually connect that to generally the source of the transistor. Um, for an SOI, we let that P channel, basically we don't connect it to anything, we just have it floating. And so we can attract carriers to, that, to the, to the uh, gate um, still by connecting the gate to a positive voltage for an NMOS device, um, but it doesn't have the, the P bulk or, or channel is not connected to the source. Um, so some SOI advantages we get is um, resistance to a, an effect called latch up, uh, which I'm not going to go into in this uh, particular it, uh, presentation, but I'll, I'll, I think I'll be going into it in a future week. Um, but uh, latch up is a real problem in silicon, uh, you know, when we have our NPN and PNP transistors. And so this gives us a resistance to that effect. Uh, it reduces our temperature dependency. We don't need the body or well taps, and so it can increase our density. And uh, it's also inherently radiation hardened. Again, uh, radiation effects are something that I'm not going to go into in this uh, foil, but um, it is an advantage of SOI. Um, some of the disadvantages for SOI is you actually get some differential stress in your silicon layer since uh, sapphire or the buried silicon oxide, since your transistors are on top of a material that is not crystalline silicon and the transistor itself is silicon crystalline, if you um, have temperature differences as, as you rise or lower the temperature, the crystalline silicon transistors um, will basically be affected by the temperature slightly different than the oxide layer that they're built on. And so you can get some stress uh, between the two different layers um, because of temperature effects and, and other effects. Um, second thing is, since you don't actually have the body of your transistor, um, the channel region uh, connected to the source voltage, as you uh, are trying to turn your transistor on and off, uh, you change your gate voltage, uh, the transistor will actually have a little bit of a history effect. Um, the, the VT for the transistor, um, since you don't know exactly what value that, that P channel is at, uh, and it can have a slightly different value over time, since you don't have a direct connection to it, uh, the threshold voltage uh, will will vary a little bit on time uh, as time goes on depending on what the previously applied voltage is and then the third disadvantage is it has a much higher uh, wafer cost um, because you're you're buying uh, sapphire or the the substrate with the bilica, uh, buried silicon oxide um, it costs more to create those types of wafers so there's some advantages some disadvantages uh, for the most part, I, I don't, I, I know SOI was used uh, by a few different fabs um, through the early 2000s. I'm not certain that it's used quite as often in uh, most fabs uh, today. So another process enhancement that has uh, come into the process technology in the last uh, five, six years or so has been the use of high K gate dielectrics. Um, so uh, what I mean by high K gate, uh, in uh, our metal oxide semiconductor MOS technology, the gate capacitance is what attracts charge uh, from the channel to, uh, to the channel in order to form the channel between the source and drain. If you have a higher capacitance, 
it allows you to use a lower voltage to get the same power or same charge in the channel. Um, so a higher capacitance allows you to get uh, the same um, strength of transistor, uh, same amount of current for a lower power. So in order to get a higher capacitance, if you're using a silicon dioxide layer that, that historically has been used as our gate oxide, um, we need to make the oxide thinner and thinner um, in order to get a higher capacitance because the capacitance is a function of one over the, the oxide thickness. Um, so if we're only using silic silicon dioxide, we've been decreasing the oxide thickness uh, for you know, 30, 40 years now. Um, now, as we're um, decreasing the oxide thickness, uh, s somewhere around the uh, process generation of 65 nanometers, um, we had been decreasing the uh, gate oxide thickness, getting down to 10 to 12 angstroms in thickness for your gate oxide. Um, the gate leakage, uh, as the, the gate oxide got thinner and thinner, we actually started getting um, uh, current through the gate. Uh, normally your your gate should have no current at all, uh, but you start getting leakage through the gate and getting current through the gate and at 45 nanometers, um, it between 65 and 45 nanometers, it started getting such a high gate leakage that it was actually a problem in your circuits. So at 45 nanometers, Intel started using a half neum based gate. So HFO2 has a dielectric constant of 20, whereas silicon dioxide had a dielectric constant of 3.9. So basically you get an improvement of 5x in gate capacitance just by making that change alone. Um, so that's a, a huge improvement, um, caused a, a great um, basically decrease uh, in your gate leakage and improved the power a lot. Um, the disadvantage of using the hafnium Bates gate is uh, basically it's not compatible with using polysilicon as the gate material anymore. So the solution that they had for going to a high K gate dielectric was to return to a metal gate um, with the high gate, uh, high K gate insulator. Um, so again, um, as I said a couple foils ago, the term metal oxide semiconductor is now technically accurate again. Um, for a long period of time, uh, 30 years or so, uh, we were actually doing polyoxide semiconductor. Now we really are uh, NMOS and PMOS um, are, are MOS again. Um, the one thing to note though is NMOS and PMOS do require different gate materials to, though uh, due to what is called the electrical work function. So the uh, difference between the silicon channel, um, the uh, uh, now hafnium based gate, and a metal, uh, metal gate um, causes a work function difference between the potential of the channel and the gate material. Um, I'm not going to go into work functions in, in this uh, lecture though, so if you're interested in that, you can look up and do research on, uh, on that. So some additional con uh, comments on the high, gate, uh, high K gate dielectric. One additional uh, disadvantage um, to using this is the metal gate has a disadvantage that it will melt if it's exposed to high temperature um, for uh, fabrication steps. <clears throat> so keep in mind, normally after we form the polygate, we have uh, source drain implant steps, uh, two, two different source drain implant steps um, that uh, need to, uh, basically we implant ions for the source drain and then after implanting, um, into the source drain, uh, the, the P plus or N plus um, ion, you know, materials, uh, we have to do a high temperature annealing step to basically activate um, these uh, carriers. 
and so that high temperature step will wind up melting uh, the metal gate if there was a metal gate there. So the solution to that is to, after we have the high, gate, high K oxide there, we put the poly gate as normal and then we form the source drain regions. We do the high temperature annealing step after doing the ion implantation. And once the source drain regions are completed, then we can polish the wafer just enough to expose the poly gate and then selectively etch the poly gate away. Um, and now we'll have a, a trench where the poly gate used to be. Um, then we can deposit metal gates into the resulting trenches and now we'll have a metal gate where the poly used to be. Keep in mind, uh, as I said earlier, a different metal is needed for the NMOS versus the PMOS gates. <clears throat> so we have two separate steps, one for NMOS gate formation and one for PMOS gate. Um, and this will increase our cost and complexity and the number of steps and materials we need to produce um, our, our silicon uh, transistors. So uh, this can cause increase in cost, increase in time in fabrication, and uh, every time you increase the number of steps, you have a po possibility of decreasing your yield. So just things to keep in mind. Uh, now, a different process enhancement <clears throat> is, uh, over the years, they found ways to increase the mobility of your semiconductor. So keep in mind, uh, the speed of your transistor, the amount of current it can carry, is related to mu sub n and mu sub p, where mu is the mobility of your n carriers or your p carriers. Well, it turns out, um, if you take your silicon channel and put it under some strain, you can actually increase your carrier mobility. <clears throat> so for example, in the 65 nanometer process, in Intel started using strain silicon to increase their NMOS and PMOS mobility um, by for the NMOS by 40% and PMOS up to 100% higher than using unstrained silicon. Now the NMOS has to be put under tensile stress, where the PMOS has to be put under compressive stress in order to get this increase in mobility. So here we're showing uh, some micrographs of NMOS um, and PMOS transistors with uh, different types of strain to them. So the NMOS has tensile stress um, basically caused by putting a layer of silicon nitride, uh, capping the, the gate with a film of silicon nitride. And effectively, it's trying to kind of pull the gate out or, or et cetera, you know. In effect, your channel has some, um, some strain pulling out from the channel. And in effect, uh, this causes um, some tensile strain that basically increases the mobility of the N-type carriers and your NMOS. For the PMOS, um, they need to do compressive stress. And what they, the way they do that is they'll actually introduce some germanium to the source drain regions of the, uh, the P plus source drain regions of the PMOS device. And this germanium, since germanium is like silicon, it's a group four element but it has a larger atomic radius than silicon. So that means that um, the source drain will, as a fraction of the silicon atoms are replaced by germanium atoms, the crystal lattice uh, starts trying to grow slightly. Um, so it retains its basic shape because it's mostly silicon, but it undergoes some strain because it has these extra larger atoms in the midst of the silicon, and so you get some compressive stress from the, the source and drain regions onto the gate, um, causing the gate uh, to get some additional uh, mobility to the P-type carriers. So um, again, more process steps, more um, types of materials being introduced, 
and it increases the processing cost and potentially causes some um, additional yield concerns. But you know, as the process generations go on, more and more processing steps and tricks are being played to get more and more performance out of uh, your transistors. So another process technique, I'm not sure that I'd necessarily call it an enhancement since it's almost completely different than our normal way of creating transistors um, with silicon substrate uh, and uh, is using uh, basically plastic transistors. So um, doing fabrication of MOS transistors using organic chemicals instead of using our uh, normal um, you know, silicon, silicon dioxide. So um, this uh, basically is, is used not so much in integrated circuits as uh, used in act active matri matrix displays um, using uh, for uses similar to such as like flexible electronic paper, RFID ID tags, um, etc. And so uh, to, to design this type of transistor, it's basically built kind of upside down from the normal way that we build um, silicon transistors. Uh, and basically we form the gate first, so we start with a substrate uh, we put down our gate and interconnect on the substrate. Then we put an organic insulator um, over top of it um, or silicon nitride of some sort. Um, then we form the source drain connections. And finally, we put uh, a semiconductor um, which acts as the body slash channel um, on the very top. Now, the mobility for like plastic PMOS um, is basically on the order of, you know, 0.15 uh, centimeter squared per volt second. This is about three orders of magnitude lower than normal silicon. Um, so these aren't high performance devices, but they're for very specific <coughs> types of uses. And also the uh, device width and length are, are not nearly the uh, small um, and not nearly as small and dense as what we get in modern day integrated circuits, but, but they're useful for very specific uses um, other than integrated circuits. So one additional process enhancement that's been done on the interconnect side is what's called a copper damascene process. Um, now, as I mentioned before, aluminum was standard for a long time uh, previously, um, but now with this copper damascene process, copper has now become the standard. Um, copper has a higher conductivity than aluminum um, and so it's definitely a lot more uh, desirable, um, but it wasn't used for a long time because it has a lot of challenges. Um, one of the biggest challenges with copper is copper atoms actually can diffuse into silicon and into silicon dioxide, um, and it can do it fairly rapidly. So uh, using copper early on, um, if you tried to do it, it would destroy your transistors um, because it would diffuse into the silicon and silicon dioxide. Um, also, etching copper, um, the process of etching copper is kind of difficult or more difficult than aluminum. And uh, copper will oxidize pretty easily and, and so that interferes with getting good com contacts um, from, very, from the copper layer to uh, silicon layer, but also copper layer to the next copper layer. Um, and finally, copper can be an environmental pollutant. So um, so there was a number of issues that they had to overcome. And <clears throat> one of the biggest, of course, is uh, the fact that copper wants to diffuse into silicon, silicon dioxide. Um, so this, uh, in order to overcome this major bar uh, barrier, is um, they created this copper damascene process that creates a barrier layer between the copper and the silicon. And in effect, uh, what they do is they create a tantalum or tantalum nitride film um, 
in any areas uh, between the copper and the silicon before you put the copper down you have to put this tantalum or tantalum nitride uh, film down first. So let's go into that next. So the figure here shows all the different steps that you need to go through to um, do the damascene process for uh, adding copper um, to, your, to your design, to your um, integrated circuit. So first you start in step A here. Uh, the, the stuff that's in the, the blue kind of uh, along in the top of above um, letter A is what you're eventually creating, but you just haven't created it yet. So um, the first thing you want to do is form a diffusion barrier etch stop on uh, uh, in your wafer in all areas other than where you want to make your contacts to your silicon. And uh, so this will be a uh, maybe like a silicon nitride or, or some sort of layer um, that you want to make sure that, that you stop um, etching in that. When In later steps when you're going to be doing etching through your silicon oxide you want to make sure to stop on uh, like a silicon nitride diffusion barrier etch stop layer. So after you form that layer on the bottom, it's kind of that gray, really thin layer on top of the wafer. Um, then in step B, you just put a uh, dielectric, um, so maybe a really thick silicon dioxide layer over your entire wafer and uh, keep it all planar. Then you put a another dielectric et etch stop um, that will stop as you're trying to go through after you form your uh, metal lines um, you want a barrier as an etch stop between the metal line and the via contact from the metal line down to the wafer and then you'll form your line dielectric over top of that and then in Step D, you'll put a anti-reflective layer on top um, just to help your mask uh, patterning uh, for your next step. Then going to line E, you will pattern your wafer and open up the area where you want your metal, so like your metal one layer. And then once you open up the area where you want metal one, and you will etch through all the oxide that is visible um, through that layer. So it will etch down through the area that's patterned. It will hit the etch stop that is the line dielectric etch stop and it won't etch anything below that but where you had the opening in the line dielectric it will etch down through all the way to the wafer so it etches through the line and it etches through where you want the via. So once you've etched all the way down to the surface of the wafer, um, then you can go on to step F, where you put this tantalum barrier all the way across the entire area where there's silicon <coughs> or silicon dioxide, because the copper will wind up being able to diffuse into either silicon or silicon dioxide. So you need to cover all silicon and silicon dioxide with the tantalum. Then going into step G, once the tantalum is over, you can put down your copper seed anywhere where there's tantalum and it will cover all of the tantalum, but it's not in contact with any silicon or silicon dioxide regions it's only in contact with tantalum. Then finally once you have a thin copper seed in you can use electroplating or um, to fill in the entire rest of where the via and metal one layer should be and now you have a uh, thick metal plug all the way down to um, contact to your uh, source drain areas or your gate and uh, finally after electroplating, the electroplating will actually probably go above where you really want it to be. Um, you, you actually want it to go above and then after it uh, gets so that it's completely filling those areas, uh, then you use a 
chemical mechanical polish to get your wafer back to completely flat. So we've talked about the metals that we want. Um, you know, obviously for our interconnect between transistors, uh, the lower resistivity metals is very desirable. But in addition to that, um, you also have between the metal or between different metal layers, uh, you need dielectrics. Um, up until now, we've always talked about using silicon dioxide as our dielectric between our metals. Um, now, the difference between, it, but there's also a difference in dielectrics that we can use. So when we were talking about gate oxides um, and gate dielectrics, we wanted higher capacitance in order to have a, a thicker gate uh, be able to provide um, higher capacitance. But when it comes to metal, we actually want low ca capacitance because the higher capacitance from one metal to another, um, it actually slows your devices down, slows your interconnect down to have higher capacitance. So you actually want as low a capacitance as possible between all your wires. So for interconnect, we want low K insulators between our wires. So as I mentioned in a previous foil, silicon dioxide has a dielectric constant between 3.9, 4.2, depending on the quality of your silicon dioxide. Um, if we want a lower uh, K insulator, um, there's a number of different things that have been used. One is um, using fluorine. So in about the 130 nanometer process technology, um, they started using SIOF that has a dielectric constant of 3.6. So it gives you maybe a 10 to 20 percent um, uh, decrease in capacitance. Um, then around the 65 to 90 nanometer uh, process technology, they started using carbon to get uh, SiCOH, um, which gets us down to 2.8 to 3. So again, another maybe 20 percent um, reduction in uh, uh, in the value of K in order to reduce your capacitance some more. Uh, then um, in later process generations uh, using a polymer called silk from uh, SILK from Dow Chemical uh, gets the K down to 2.6 and at one point um, IBM even demonstrated uh, trying to use air gaps in some of their uh, process steps. Um, and the figure on the right shows a micrograph showing some of the air gaps you can see in, in particular for the, the highest two metal layers um, in the kind of upper left corner, you can see that they, they have like a couple air gaps um, to the right and left of a metal wire. Uh, in the, the layer down a little bit more on the right hand side, but toward the right hand side you can see there's some air gaps between the metal layer. Now the benefit of air gaps is the K value is 1.0, so you can really reduce your capacitance. But again, um, there is a problem with that is air does not have structural um, integrity. It's just a, a hole, um, so it, it makes it a lot harder to uh, keep your structural integri integrity of your overall design when you have, you know, basically air gaps in your design. But um, it does definitely improve and reduce your capacitance uh, values of your metal wires. So there's trade-offs on, uh, you know, you might have decreased yield, but improved imp in performance on things that are yielding well.